Hello and welcome to Europe's Climate and Environment, a new video podcast by the European Environment Agency here in Copenhagen, where we break down the latest data and information on climate and environment through the insights of our experts. It is so essential that we stay the course on our environment and climate goals. Because it is not only that the science is clear, but also that it is a compelling case for the security and competitiveness. So all the good reasons to continue the consistent, co coherent path towards more sustainable, uh, climate resilient, environmentally sustainable Europe. My name is Constant Brand and welcome to our show. We are starting our video podcast with special episodes on our new uh, Europe's Environment 2025 report, the most comprehensive and largest report and analysis done on Europe's climate and environment. It includes uh, data and information from 38 countries across Europe. The last report was published in 2020. Europe has changed a lot since then. To dissect key elements of the new analysis, joining us today is Lena Loa-Monanen, our EEA Executive Director. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Now, for the special series, of course, we're focusing on Europe's Environment 2025 report. This was the last one. Mm. Quite a big, thick report. Uh, of course, we're not printing it this time, for obvious reasons. For Times environment. have changed. Times have changed. So let's dig into the new report. I th I'm sure our audience would like to know what the key conclusions are of the report. If you could uh, highlight those for us. To bluntly summarize, the state of Europe's environment is not good. First of all, we are the fastest warming continent in the world, warming twice as fast as um, other parts of the world. Um, biodiversity is still declining, um, both in the land, seas, uh, fresh waters. And of course, pollution is still also a problem. And I think behind all these planetary crises, we have the unsustainable resource use. So, but we are using clearly, I mean, too much resources um, in comparison to what is sustainable and much more than other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, nature is sort of at the heart of Absolutely. what we need to protect and preserve. Yeah, because that is providing us the resources that is, of course, I mean, uh, essential for our well-being and yes, uh, for our way of life. So this report finds itself five years removed from the last one mm -hmm. uh, in 2019, 2020. Obviously, Europe has changed quite a lot since then. Uh, perhaps you could put a little bit of context into how Europe has changed. Indeed, I mean, totally different geopolitical, political, economic, um, but also climate uh, context that we have this report now landing. And of course, I mean, first we had the COVID uh, pandemic crisis, which still has the tales of economic and social issues. And then, of course, the you know, Russian's uh, war of aggression against Ukraine now lasting I mean, years and years, is putting really uh, a pressure. Uh, and of course, I mean, the, creating the new priorities. Defense, security, let's say strategic autonomy are more important than ever. It's evident. But at the same time, indeed, I mean, our climate change is accelerating and we can see the impacts already, also in Europe, um, of the heated uh, globe. And, um, and of course, I mean, it is a turbulent times for the citizens. Um, they are still having really, I mean, rough times uh, economically, socially. Um, and we have to see that we have a change that is also keeping everybody on board and leaving no, no one behind. And of course, the European Green Deal, exactly five, five years ago, yep. or let's say uh, starting five years ago, was a very different uh, political agenda. But what is really critical and also very well highlighted in the, in the State of the Union speech by um, President von der Leyen, it is so essential that we keep and stay the course on our environment and climate goals. Because it is not only that the science is clear, but also that it is a compelling case for the security and competitiveness. So all the good reasons to continue the consistent, co coherent path towards more sustainable, uh, climate resilient, environmentally sustainable Europe. Indeed. And that's... That's exactly the point. I mean, a lot of people will wonder, well, you know, we have these other priorities now that almost supersede the ones on environment and climate. However, as you mentioned, climate change is getting worse. We've seen the, the wildfires in, in, in many parts of Europe this summer, the flooding uh, last winter, the heat waves as well. What, what is the cost of, of not continuing staying the course? It would be detrimental, of course, to Europe not to start preparing seriously uh, to the changing climate. 
our societies are, are not prepared. I mean, so many people are living under flood prone areas. Um, our housing, our buildings are not uh, really, I mean, um, fit for the future climate or the current climate either. And our infrastructure, our, our systems are not really up to the, the, the change that we already see uh, and the impact that we already see, see and, and have here in Europe. So there has to be a lot of, uh, lot of work uh, to, to prepare our societies for more climate resilience uh, future. Mm -hmm. Of course, we, uh, earlier this year, we presented the Europe Climate Risks Report, which is sort of linked to this report as well. Uh, but that was really an eye-opener for Europe, wasn't it? Absolutely. And now, of course, we are starting to prepare the, the second uh, UCRA report. And this area, I think, is a, is a, needs growing attention also from all levels, both the European level, member states, also the regions and cities who need to all take action. And of course, also the business, the citizens themselves, uh, because everything is at stake. Um, and even the northern part of uh, like Denmark or Finland, my own country, are not uh, saved from, from these impacts. Mm -hmm. We see indeed, I mean, the heat waves, even in up north, um, all floods can be here in Denmark, I mean, city floods. So it is, a, it is an urgent call. Obviously, the report also highlights is not only climate change that we need to work more on and stay the course on. Uh, we've done well on mitigation, mm. on reducing greenhouse gases, um, and on air pollution. Perhaps you can explain a little bit what are the key other areas that we, we, we need to continue focusing on. Yeah, indeed, it's good to highlight that we, it's not all doom and gloom. So we have also really, I mean, improved on, on certain areas and, and the cutting of the greenhouse gases is, the, is perhaps the best example. It's, a, it's really an impressive uh, progress that we have made since the 1990s. I mean, and, and Europe is clearly leading the world on fighting and mitigating climate change and reducing its own greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the air pollution, reducing air pollution, also because of the consistent, coherent, long-term policies and actions, implementation um, at all levels. I mean, we have been really, I mean, improving the air quality in Europe and saving lives, saving human lives. So those are really the examples that, yes, we can do it. But unfortunately, there are many things where we don't see yet this kind of change or the, the turn of the, of the trends. And uh, as mentioned, the biodiversity decline is, is perhaps one of the sort of the hidden uh, crisis. It's so much more difficult to observe um, the ecosystems, habitat, species uh, decline. But now uh, the latest report is clearly showing that it's not getting better. It is actually declining in many areas, both at the ecosystems and habitats and species level. So this is definitely an area where we really need to, to invest. And of course, we have now I mean, also great policies and uh, legislation in place. Now it's time to, to implement these uh, policies. Yeah. yeah. Another key point, another priority for the Commission, also for the EU, is resilience mm -hmm. um, and water resilience. Uh, we also uh, linked to this report, issued one uh, earlier this spring on water resilience. Can you explain a little bit how this threads into Europe's environment report? Yeah, I mean, we, Europe is under water stress. I mean, really a big part of our citizens are feeling it in every day. I mean, that there is either water scarcity or the quality is not that good. Uh, and of course, the businesses, the sectors, uh, agriculture, they are all also suffering from, from this water stress. And of course, again, the link between this and accelerating climate change is making things worse. So droughts, but also floods, which then usually have um, also consequences on the water quality. This is, this is all linked. So we have to really, I mean, see how we both, I mean, create more resilient water systems. I mean, slow the flow of the rivers, yeah. for example, and have these kind of um, sponge um, environments. Nature-based solutions are great for that. But also how the cities, the, the let's say housing areas can prepare for this uh, uh, floods um, and then of course the, for the agriculture it's a big thing i mean how to adapt to more frequent droughts mm -hmm. yeah it's it's heavy uh <laughs> these things um uh, but there is hope the report says uh, perhaps you can explain to the viewers and, and the listeners that it's not all doom and gloom as you said earlier mm -hmm. indeed i mean these examples of uh, cutting the greenhouse gas emissions uh, improving the air quality show that we can do it uh, with the, indeed, consistent policies and, and good um, targeted implementation and action. And of course, implementation as a word, I mean, it's, it's, it takes a lot. 
it's not only at the member states level, I mean, turning the EU legislation to the national legislation, it's really all, at all levels. Uh, planning, I mean, then then actually doing the, for example, constructions differently, um, changing our systems. Um, so all actors are needed in this, um, and, um, and hence I hope also that this implementation is bringing hope, because I mean, when you can do something, uh, there's also, it brings hope. But all in all, yes, we show that I mean the EU policies can drive change, even systemic change, and that, at least to me, and I hope that the report brings it uh, also to the wider audience, gives hope. We have the levers, many levers. I mean, many basic things already in place. Uh, there's green financing, um, innovation is I mean increasing on in the clean tech uh, area. So we basically know what we should do. Uh, now it's then time to implement. We need to do it. Mm. We need to do it. Of course, we, we talk about sustainability in, in a following episode of our special series. Uh, but I just wanted to touch a bit on circular economy that is, and these systems. It's a lot of big, heavy terms here, but um, food system and the consumption and production systems that we have. Um, well, the report makes clear what the problems are, but maybe... Somebody would say, well, what can I do? What can citizens do? What can citizens take away from this report? Well, there is hopefully many messages that the citizens can take. But it, of course, I mean, the resource use, the consumption in Europe is really one of the highest in the world and clearly unsustainable. And this is calling, of course, all actors, especially on the design uh, and production phase, but also at the consumer phase, to consider how we can make our systems more uh, sustainable. Uh, reuse, recycle, of course, all these are all things that also citizens are doing, uh, not only that they can do, but they are doing. And uh, again, the EU legislation um, on waste area and, and circular economy is, is, is making this um, to a system level. But yes, we also need to accelerate because, I mean, the, for example, the recycling rate in Europe is appallingly low and it has not really improved a lot in the last 15 years. So... There are challenges, but also now, of course, I mean, really, also because of this security and resilience and strategic autonomy reasons, much more focus on how can we use within the European Union, within Europe, I mean, our own resources more cleverly, more strategically. Um, and, and recycling, I mean, reuse, all this is uh, part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but compared to five years ago, I mean, uh, don't you think a public awareness is much higher now. I mean, the Eurobarometer, the uh, public survey across Europe has shown that climate remains a priority for, for citizens yeah. all around Europe. Indeed, especially in the climate action field. I mean, yes, there's a strong support from the, from the European citizens for, for more action, more, more uh, concrete um, targets as well, etc. So that's a good basis. But of course, now I know policymakers, decision makers are in a difficult situation, but there are also competing priorities like indeed, I mean, investment in defense and security or, or let's say the competitiveness of the, of the continent in, in, in general. But as I said, we can also see the links between these things. So they are actually mutually supportive uh, priorities. Um, so... I hope that our report will partially explain how everything is linked, um, including our environment and climate goals, to these more burning priorities of the decision makers, uh, security and competitiveness, resilience. Yeah, and talk about the decision makers. You gave a sneak preview to the ministers of environment at the formal uh, ministerial meeting in July under the Danish presidency here in Denmark. Um, we talked a little bit about the citizens, but uh, could you give some impression of, of how your presentation there was received by the ministers. Of course, it's difficult to say when you are yourself getting the presentation, but um, but I believe that the, based on the feedback that we we received, uh, that it did resonate with uh, with that audience. Of course, climate and environment ministers of they they <laughs> should be interested, and they I think they were. It's of course now how how they can use our knowledge, our this data, this report for in their countries uh, in their EU decision making and of course we should also be able to reach with our messages other than the environment and climate ministers also the other um, ministers and uh, ministries uh, would need Certainly to hear these messages presidents and prime ministers and uh, finance ministers especially I assume absolutely and of course in the EU I mean also the European Parliament the Council we hope yeah. to have I mean many discussions also with the other other than the let's say 
usual suspects. Yeah. And of course, I mean, there, there's been some pushback over recent years against the Green Deal and certainly fears of change, uh, especially in, 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 in the agricultural sector. Um, so I guess their outreach to, to these communities is important as well. This would be really important. Of course, already in the making of the report, we have been more more now engaging also with the different stakeholders, including business, uh, youth organizations, etc. We could do even more of that. And I think all in all, the, the current climate, the political climate is calling for more dialogue. And, and we hope also to play a part in that when trying to bring the, our messages from the report also to these new, let's say, more new audiences. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is part of the show when we ask our guests a little bit to delve into their past or maybe their future or present and what drives them and why you work in the field that you work in and climate and environment. So Lena, what what passions, what 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 drives you to work in this area? How did you start in this area? I studied environmental sciences in Helsinki University in the 1980s. That was the time of the acid rain, ozone a hole. Um, of course, we had also the Cold War still, <laughs> still ongoing, so yeah. quite a different world. And I have seen during my long career in the civil service, I mean, uh, change for good and bad, um, especially climate change, of course, has now taken the really also in my mind the, the, the attention uh, from among all these many uh, environmental um, issues. But I'm also, yeah, I'm a mother of two. I care for the both the people and the planet, and I cannot think of anything more important than to work uh, for the future of our, basically, our humanity. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned us and radio and all those environmental problems. How do you think they compare to the ones then in the 80s? When I was young, I, I, I remember the acid rain problem, but compared to the problems we face now in climate and environment, how can you compare mm. them? I think we are in a different phase, and that, that message is the urgency. Um, and of course, the past gives you the, the comfort that, yes, we can do changes. So acid rain was solved. Um, ozone hole is healing, um, we hear. So p mankind can do things and put in place measures also in the global context that are improving the environment yeah yeah great thank you very much thank you thank you for joining us today for our first episode of our special series on europe's environment 2025 report for more information on the analysis you can find it at eea.europa.eu where you can also find other data and information on our latest climate environment reports please join us next time when we delve into the data and networks behind europe's environment 2025 report and the people that help build the report across 38 countries. Mm -hmm.